Okay, uh, hello to you, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming to the seminar. Uh, for the very, very first time, we also have a live internet stream that will hopefully work without problems. Uh, so, hello to everyone also observing the stream from Culture Evolution Seminar in Tartu. Um, this is the second seminar this fall, and um, it's the first time that we have a featured guest uh, speaker who has been kind enough to tell us about her work. So, I'm very happy to introduce. Uh, Christina Moya, who is uh, now speaking to us from Leipzig uh, and is on the screen now. Hi, Christina. Hi, yeah. I'm uh, a bit afraid that the timing might be a bit lagged, but hopefully the gist of the presentation will still make sense. I hope so. Now it, now it sounds fine. It sounds good? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty quick feedback. Um, so Christina is now an assistant professor at UC Davis in California and currently also a senior research scientist at the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. Her research interest is, uh, her main research interest is in the unique evolutionary history of our cultural species and uh, how social behavior responds adaptively to cultural structure. She has worked on topics like the influence of linguistic boundaries on social organization and social cognition, the evolution of social learning, social influences, on reproductive decisions, um, third party responses to normal violations and so on. She has experience in anthropological field work experiments as well as some computation modeling, I think. Uh, her topic today is about the evolution and ontogeny of ethno-linguistic reasoning. So a bit of structure for the seminar. As she offered, it would be good to ask questions right away if you feel a little bit confused or if you want some clarification. So if you want to do that, uh, you can sit on this chair and then it will be very prominently seen and uh, she will also notice that and then we will have a break for that. Uh, if you have uh, more general questions, you can leave them at the end. We have some space for discussion so you can um, save it. If you are looking at this on the internet, you can also post comments uh, under the video and we will try to include them in the discussion as well when we can. Um, and since this is the very first time that we are trying to do it with the stream, like you have technical issues with it, please let us know as well. But without further ado, um, Christina Moya. Um, Thanks so much, Peter, for the introduction and for all of you for trying this experiment with me. Um, please do not feel afraid to come to the front chair. That looks very intimidating, but it will help <laughs> me also know whether the, the words that I'm using make sense. So, for example, even now I'm realizing that in the title, um, ontogeny might not be clear, and what I mean by that is the development through the life course of how people think about ethno-linguistic boundaries. Okay, so please do interrupt me. Um, this picture uh, is meant to kind of give you a sense of where we're going with this presentation. I took this picture in my field site in the Peruvian Multiplana on the Quechua and Mara language boundary. And I'm going to just tell you for now that there are both Quechua and Mara speakers there. And I hope to convince you that, that um, this is a really great opportunity, a really great site for asking some of the questions about how humans reason about um, language boundaries. Um, so we'll get to that later. I want to start with a bigger picture. Let's see, did this work? No. Um, kind of a bigger picture uh, point here, which is that humans are the only species um, that marks itself into symbolically uh, structured ethnic groups. And uh, this is also universal, so you can see quite a lot of variation here in the ways that we mark ourselves um, and the groups that we organize ourselves into, but they characterize all human societies. And because different um, social scientists mean different things by ethnic groups. I just want to clarify that for the purpose of this talk, by ethnic groups I simply mean symbolically marked groups of people who share cultural attributes, perhaps institutions, perhaps norms and skills. I'm not saying anything about their genetic background necessarily, okay? So by this definition, um, let's see, this is updating. Yeah, by this definition, we can include subgroups in large nation states, for example, like punk or Amish people, um, in addition to kind of the groups that anthropologists have more traditionally been studying, 
that are at smaller scale um, and kind of separate from the nation state. Okay, so by my definition for now, those are both ethnic groups. And if we compare that situation to what we see in some of our closest living relatives, um, chimpanzees in this case, I think we get much cuter pictures, but we see that they are not symbolically marked in any way. Um, one chimpanzee group at least looks fairly similar to the next chimpanzee group, and they don't use any kind of cultural markers or cultural content to moderate the way that they interact with each other. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have culture. They do, right? So there is social learning in chimpanzees, and there is um, social learning in a lot of species. And actually, there was a recent article regarding chimpanzees showing that a lot of the culture that they have seems to be passed down from mother to child, so it's not necessarily shared more broadly in the cultural group, which might be another difference between um, kind of uh, non-human primate culture and human culture, but that still needs to be explored. What I'm focusing on for now is that they're not using the cultural differences to signal to each other what group, which group they belong to or to influence how they interact with each other. Okay, And that's quite different to the human situation. And returning to this big picture um, kind of human landscape, it shows that in addition to the really different ecological environments that humans have adapted to, we've adapted to rainforest living, to desert living, to arctic living within the span of you know, a couple thousands of years fairly quickly, we've also have, to, have had to adapt to the diverse cultural landscapes and ethnic landscapes that we have produced for ourselves. And if we want to understand how we did that, we might want to go to the archaeological or paleontological record, um, and then we would find things like these shell beads, for example, that are over 100 um, thousand years ago that were found in South Africa and this ochre which was used to mark um, people's bodies, people used it to mark their bodies. Um, so we would get evidence for at least over 100,000 years ago people have been using some sort of aesthetic markers um, to as ornaments but we will not know what this means in terms of their social consequences. We will not know um, whether this influenced how they interacted with each other or what it meant to them. So because of that, I focus on modern human behavior and modern human cognition and how it develops to get a sense of what our kind of cognitive structures, what our psychology looks like, given that we've created these um, ethnic environments for ourselves. Okay, so this is just a very simple model of what I think we're looking at, what the, what the question is, what the problem is. We have this arrow, which is cult cultural evolutionary processes have given rise to these ethnic landscapes, these diverse boundaries, these diverse cultural traits that co-vary with the boundaries, with the markers, with language, etc. And in response to that, oops, yeah, in response, um, Okay, well, in response to that, you know, I want to ask this question, how do we adapt flexibly? Oh boy, I think we're two steps ahead on the slides, but that's okay. So, one possibility is that in response to these new ethnic landscapes that we have culturally evolved, we might respond adaptively because we have some ancestral plastic responses that we might share with other species as well. For example, if you put a cheetah in a zoo, it's not like he evolved in the zoo, but he'll develop less muscularity, right? So we all have certain levels of plasticity that allow us to be flexible in response to different ecological settings. And maybe that's what we're doing when we uh, face these new ethnic landscapes. Another possibility is that we have genetic adaptations as a, spe as a species, we share genetic adaptations in response to these ethnic landscapes. So for example, some people have suggested that this is the way that we do language learning, that we have genetic adaptations for language learning because we culturally evolved very complex languages. And maybe that's true for the way that we think about ethnic landscapes as well. Sorry. Um, okay. All right. 
the third possibility here, so that shows up now, right? Three squares on your screen. So the third possibility is that we have cultural adaptations that respond to these cultural landscapes. So maybe we didn't genetically change because we produce these diverse cultural landscapes, but we just develop new cultural adaptations to be able to learn about, to be able to reason about these cultural landscapes. So for example, in the domain of technology, it's clear that once we domesticated um, cattle, let's say, for it became more useful to develop new ways of creating plows in order to do agriculture more efficiently. And perhaps we have similar kinds of stereotype formation and concept formation um, that culturally evolves in response to these ethnic landscapes. Mm. Okay, so Okay, now it's updated, right? There are two boxes on your screen? Yes. Okay, so now in response to these ethnic landscapes, I'm suggesting that we should study these ethnic reasoning adaptations regardless of what their source is. Sometimes you can tell apart those sources, sometimes it'll be harder. Um, but I also want to argue that we shouldn't be thinking of them as a simple a single group psychology. Instead, we should be thinking which parts of the landscape correspond to which adaptations, okay? We don't know whether we have a single group psychology or whether we have different features of the environment that give rise to different um, adaptive responses. So for example, one of these boxes might be punishment institutions. So at certain boundaries, we might have punishment institutions, norms of who should be ostracized or who should be put in jail or who should be whipped according to their violation of different norms. And if you have punishment institutions at a certain scale that prevents people from being defectors, let's say, or non-cooperative, then we might expect that that's the same scale at which we would expect in-group altruism, okay? So if people are, have separate consequences for being bad, then maybe at that same scale, you would expect some in-group favor, favoritism or cooperation. And that's quite separate from the possibility that a lot of other norms might cluster. So perhaps like religious traditions or music traditions or traditions of marriage might not correspond to the same part of the landscape that punishment institutions correspond to. Now, if we have this clustering of norms, so that is that multiple norms co-vary with each other, then we might expect to see stereotyping or predicting that other people are going to behave similarly along multiple traits because they belong to the certain norm cluster, even if you're not in group altruistic. So those might be separable. And then, Separate from that, da, da, da. Do we go? No. Okay. Separate from that, you might expect that if there are certain groups that really are endogamous, that means that they marry within the group and they don't really allow my, um, marriage between groups, then you might get these beliefs that you are whatever you are the identity of what your parents are, regardless of where you go in the world. You might expect that people then start thinking, okay, um, and you can't change your ethnic identity later on in your life, regardless of whether they have stereotypes about the group or whether they were in group altruistic. Okay. A second thing that I want to argue is that it's possible that, in fact, these look like they are all the same thing because they have often corresponded to language boundaries or linguistic boundaries, perhaps dialect or accent differences. Um, and so, the, so then, if that were the case, then we might see that humans privilege language cues for in-group altruism, for stereotyping, and for stability beliefs. So then, why privilege language boundaries would be the question. Um, and I'm suggesting that children, especially as they're learning about their roles, might privilege language cues as ethnic group markers, um, even if they have to up, be able to update their beliefs in contexts where language is actually not very useful. 
Um, but the reason why language might be generally useful is that it tends to be a social organizer in many parts of the world. It tends to correspond to lots of cultural norms, um, ranges of reciprocity, um, oftentimes in endogamy. And so this is a map of the subway system, the tube system in London, which is one of the very well connected cities of the world. And it shows you the tubes are colored by the second most commonly spoken language at that tube stop. And so you'll see, I think my mouse doesn't work great, right? but you'll see that the orange spot is like an area that is um, where there are a lot of Bengali speakers, for example, and there are some brown neighborhoods of Lithuanian speakers, and there are blue neighborhoods of French speakers. So even in this very well-connected city, you still get this clustering of where people live according to their primary language, and oftentimes even though they also speak English, right? Um, and we see this very commonly in the ethnographic record as well in smaller scale societies. So this is uh, a map of Papua New Guinea, which is one of the most ethno-linguistically diverse regions of the world. Um, and it also serves to remind us that uh, languages probably, there were more languages, languages were probably more diverse and more um, kind of important in terms of corresponding to other cultural norms and institutions before a lot of imperial expansions kind of have started wiping out a lot of language diversity. So if we look at where a lot of research is done today, in terms of psychological research, for example, developmental psychological research is often done in European countries and in the US and Canada, places that are actually very linguistically homogenous. Okay, so we're really underrepresenting parts of the world, the majority of the world really, that perhaps because they've been less influenced by um, states or by imperial conquest in the last couple 500 years, um, maybe have maintained more of their language diversity. Perhaps something that's more um, representative of how languages were structured before. Um, another reason that language is very important, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that um, it's available to children really early on in development. So even in the uterus, infants or fetuses are um, capable of recognizing um, sound from the outside world, and as soon as they're born, they can actually differentiate between their mother's language and a foreign language on the basis of cadence. So very early on and repeatedly, children have access to this information of the language that's around them. They have to learn to become language learners very quickly, and they use it on a daily basis. So this is another reason why language might be privileged, by, especially by children, when forming categories in their world. So anyway, because I think that we've been focusing on linguistically homogenous parts of the world, um, I decided to start working in the Peruvian Altiplano, which um, is slightly more linguistically diverse, so I worked in a trilingual area there, represented by the star. Okay, and I'm going to address two main research questions with data that I collected there. One is this question of whether ethnic phenomena are products of a single or of distinct evolutionary processes. So can we really think of that second box uh, of psychological adaptations for ethnic reasoning as a single you know, mechanism, or do we really have to start thinking about how each mechanism corresponds to different parts of the landscape? And the second question I'm going to address is whether humans privilege linguistic boundaries when learning about and interacting with others, particularly early on in development. Sometimes I worry about clicking twice because then I think it will go forward too much. Okay, so I'm going to preview the results just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we know where we're going. So I'm going to structure the talk according to those three possible ethnic reasoning adaptations. One, in-group altruism, two, stereotyping, and three, stability beliefs. And I try to measure these among adults in the Peruvian context. 
And what I found was that anchor of altruism is mostly organized at the community level, not at the language level for adults. And stereotyping, on the other hand, is mostly organized or triggered by cues of market integration differences. So whether they're more uh, people are more educated or more likely to be part of the market economy um, or use money rather than be subsistence agriculturalists, that mattered a lot in terms of people's stereotypes about others. And finally, these stability beliefs, oftentimes called essentialist beliefs, that you are inherently one thing and you stay that thing throughout your life and intergenerationally. Basically, the adults in the Peruvian context didn't really hold this belief for any group. So they're not very essentialist. And on the other hand, we see a different pattern with children there, which is that for pretty much all of these um, potential adaptations for all of these outcomes, they privilege language over other cues, okay? even though the adults did not. So that's where we're going. Um, and I'm going to return to the evidence for each of these after I describe first a little bit more about the field site context. Okay, so the reason I ended up in Peru, I prefaced this a little bit earlier, is that I was trying to find a strong test case for a hypothesis about the importance of language boundaries. I wanted to, it to be um, very unlikely that confounds were really driving the results, okay? And so I hope to convince you that this is the case in the Peruvian context. So I work with Quechua and Aymara speakers um, in this context, and Quechua and Aymara are two of the most commonly spoken indigenous languages of the New World. So I hope you can see that the striped areas, kind of in the middle of Peru, are Quechua speaking areas. Depends on how you count the language Quechua, you can also get Quechua speakers all the way up in Ecuador and all the way south in Argentina as well. Okay? So it's a big language family. And probably some linguists would want to argue that these are actually different languages. The people where I work actually didn't even know that Quechua was spoken in Ecuador, for example. Um, but they are right on the boundary with the dotted area. I hope you see the dotted area between Bolivia and Peru. That represents the Aymara language family. And these two languages are mutually unintelligible. Um, they cannot understand each other on the basis of the language alone, but they've been interacting with each other for a long time. So you can see this on the basis of the structure of the language and word borrowings and grammatical borrowings from Aymara to Quechua and back. Um, but most people in the context where I work, under age 50, also speak Spanish, so that facilitates interaction. And even before that, a lot of the people older than 50 also were bilingual between Quechua and Aymara as well. So it doesn't seem to serve as too much of an impediment to interaction. Um, okay, oops. So I wanted to show you also one of the Cool things is that at the region that the regional level it seems to structure the genetic difference much more than the language does. So the language groups are not genetically structured groups, okay, in the way that other people use the term ethnicity. So you can see on the right hand side this yellow circle. These are Quechua and Aymara speakers in the Bolivian department in Bolivia. So this is like a PCA. So you can see that the Quechua and Aymara um, in the Beni, for example, are very similar to each other, even if they speak different languages. And then the Quechua and the Aymara and the blue circles on the left are also quite similar to each other and very dissimilar from the Bolivian ones. Okay? And there are some other interesting um, communities represented here, but they have peculiar stories, so I'm not going to get into them. I just want to show you that molecular anthropologists have actually confirmed that space seems to matter a lot more at the larger regional level than does language in structuring the genetic diversity here. So that's useful for our case. That means that genetic differences are not going to be confounding the language boundary so much. Um, so this is the little box here is actually where I work on the north side of the Titicaca, and the star represents the town, which is right on the Quechua side of the Quechua Aymara border. Okay. I think I should have had fewer slides. Okay. Um, and so this is the town. You can see a landscape of the town where I was working. You can see that it's on the Quechua side of the, of the divide. The Wakasani district is majority Quechua. 
Um, but the communities that are closest to it, Ancomarca and Sustia, are majority Aymara speaking. Okay, that's going to be represented in blue for the remainder of the talk. And there are bridges that cross the river that make it very easy for them to interact with each other on market days and also in school. So here you can see that the school, the high school in town, um, is pretty much evenly split between Kesha and Aymara speakers. And most of the people here engage in some level of subsistence agripastoralism, but there's also some trading um, outside of the town with the rainforest uh, communities, but also with the coastal communities. Some people have shops, some people go to work in the mine. So there are economic differences that correspond to more or less market integration, and those cross cut the language boundary, which is really important because it means that there's this other way of organizing the world that might be more important than the language boundary. Another reason why this is a strong test case, apart from the fact that they're not genetically different, people don't think that they can differentiate who's Quechua or Aymara speaking based on physical traits of them. Okay? So they can't rely on cues of uh, morphological differences, for example, to form stereotypes about each other. They're also relatively similar in power. They are both more disenfranchised compared to the urban people or the wider people in the cities as well. So they are relatively similar in power and relatively similar in number depending on the scale at which you are looking at that question. So there isn't really like a minority majority dynamic here um, or a powerful versus less powerful dynamic. And as I mentioned earlier, also, neither of them are immigrants to this area, or at least they don't think of themselves as immigrants to the area. Of course, we're all immigrants. Um, but they think there's not this host versus immigrant dynamic at play. So again, this means that those kinds of compounds that are often um, plaguing the psychological literature in the US and European context are taken care of or controlled for in this context. Okay, and to give you a sense of what the language boundary looks like, well, there are some women on the left who are Aymara speaking and some women on the right who are Kesha speaking. And I took these photographs on the same day in the same place, a couple meters apart from each other. And these Aymara women and Kesha women were celebrating the same festival using the same rituals and traditions. And that was what I was showing you in the title slide as well was a picture of this festival where Quechua and Aymara speakers are celebrating the same holiday with little animosity in the same location, again using the same cultural beliefs and traditions, which are largely shared. And in contrast to that, the market integration differences are really important. So for example, if you get rich in the mine, you can afford to build this brick three-story building that's very fancy. Uh, in contrast to the more common adobe structures on the right hand side. If you are more market integrated or more urban, you can also afford to eat greasier food. You could basically afford to do things that are unhealthy for you, like eat greasier food, um, more meat, more pasta, more rice, which are high prestige food items, in contrast to the less market integrated, more rural people who rely more on the potatoes that they grow, quinoa, tari, beans that they grow, um, and also um, some meat from especially sheep and a little bit cow. And those are differences that in other parts of the world might be considered ethnic differences, but here they correspond to this market integration boundary. Um, so that's kind of, that provides a neat contrast for us. Okay, so in this context, what does linguistic agriculturism look like? Can we find any evidence that still Quechua speakers prefer to interact with Quechua speakers or are more cooperative with Quechua speakers? So do linguistic boundaries motivate in-group altruism in a context like this? You might remember that I think the answer is no. So I'm going to show you some evidence from ethnographic interviews from um, from economic gains, let's see if it's coming, and also from some measurements of implicit bias to try to show you that actually there's very little evidence for in-group um, bias or in-group preference or in-group altruism in this context. 
Okay, so one ethnographic um, anecdote that I think is really important is that Watasani, here where the star is, it's the name of the town but also of the district, it used to be part of the Quechua majority province. So Watasani is Quechua speaking and it used to be historically part of Azangaro, Putina, which was Quechua speaking. And then in the 1970s, they got tired of that and they chose to join the majority Aymara speaking province of Watasani. Okay, so they willingly chose to become a linguistic minority in their new province, even though they had been a linguistic majority before. Um, and I've done interviews about this, so are you okay with this? Like, are you upset that you guys became a minority in this, that you're now part of Wangkane, this Aymara province, um, and it's majority, and now you're in the minority? And people say repeatedly, you know, they're very happy by that. Um, historical development, there's no you know, um, regret about that. So that's kind of a compelling piece of evidence that this isn't a salient part of their um, kind of social identity. But perhaps they're just telling me this, and maybe when there are real stakes on the line, they will show some angry preference. So to deal with that, I ran an economic game using both regional and linguistic group boundaries. So here I ask people to allocate money between somebody from their regional in-group that is metro speaking, that's the star here, and somebody who from, was from a regional out-group, either a Ketra speaking regional out-group in yellow or an Aymara speaking regional out-group in blue. So these are out-groups that they wouldn't have had social networks with, but they would have known of those communities. So here, we ran some dictator games last year where half of the participants um, were given uh, a comparison between an in-group village person from Watasani, from their own village, and an out-group village person from Tarako, a Quechua speaking out-group. And they had to allocate five solas between those two individuals. And these are real stakes, we then went and distributed this money, um, but anonymously so. So the five stories correspond to about a third of the day's wage. And the other half of participants were given the same exact setup, but instead they had to allocate the money between an in-group village person from Matasani and an out-group village person from Vita Chico, which is an Aymara speaking out-group, okay? So here I'm showing you the proportion of those five soles that they gave to the in-group Quechua um, speaker. Okay, so they are in-group biased in the sense that they give more money, more than half of their money, to the in-group, in-village person who happens to be Ketra speaking like them. But does it matter where the out-group village is? Does it matter that if the out-group village is Ketra or Amara? Not so much. A little bit. They give a little bit less to the Amara speaking out-group village, but not much. And in fact, in another study that I ran, um, this was actually reversed with respect to how they punish thieves. So I really think this is not a meaningful difference. And in another economic game, we actually reduced the reputational concern by adding a random element to the game so that the, they could be sure that the experimenters couldn't know how they responded. Let's see. And that reduced the bias even further. Um, yeah, so here is the data when we introduce randomness to reduce the reputational concern, and again, the bias is pretty much non-existent. Okay. So maybe the language affects implicit biases that they're not willing to show explicitly with this economic game. And so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the implicit association test. Um, it's a way of getting a sense of whether people have unconscious associations between different concepts that are hard to fake, basically. And the way that this is done, well, the way that I did this um, is with audio cues because people weren't necessarily literate in this context. And um, people are presented one by one with either Quechua or Aymara speech, some words that they would recognize as either Quechua or Aymara. And at the other time, they would have to um, categorize pictures of either nice things like flowers or ugly things like spiders, okay? 
and they have to try to categorize these as quickly as possible using two buttons. In some of the trials, the bad things, the spiders, use the same button as the outgroup Aymara speech, okay? And so in this case, the, what I'm showing you, the negative stimuli are correlated with the button of the outgroup, and so if they have an outgroup bias, this should be cons a consistent pairing, and this should cause them to categorize these relatively quickly, is the idea. Okay, so those should be fast categorizations. And in contrast to that, if we flip the negative stimuli to be associated with the button that is for the in-group language, sorry, there's just a delay, I think, going forward. Okay, here we go. So we can flip that, so now they have to categorize the spiders with the catchword words, and this should make it a lot slower for them if they have an in-group preference bias. So that's how the implicit association test works. In general, you can actually go try one for yourself online. There are plenty of them online. Um, I forget their website, but you can ask me later if you want. And so I was able to run this test with, um, with adults and with children, about 77 of each. And what we find is only a very mild implicit in-group bias. So here is the higher the in-group bias, the effect size D here, the higher the preference, or the, the stronger the association between the positive stimuli, the flowers, and the casual words. And we did test whether flowers were considered nice and spiders bad, and that was true even in this context. And another thing that we see here is that, if anything, that bias is decreasing with age, right? It's not very, um, it's not very strong to begin with, but it decreases with age. Okay, but what does it mean that, what does this effect size do you mean? What does it mean for it not to be very strong? Well, um, I was using a method adopted from Andy Barron et al. And so they use the same method with these age categories in the US with white participants categorizing white and black um, other people, stimuli of people. And you can see here that those are consistently high consistently at twice as high, and they don't change across development in the U.S. context. And I also found another study using, um, for example, um, Japanese and Korean uh, group boundaries, and again, those effect sizes were comparable to the American ones, and the Peruvian ones were much smaller, much weaker. Okay. Okay, uh, well, anyway, so linguistic preferences um, in this context, if anything, are weak and they decrease with age. So going to the next possibility, we might still see that even if they don't like their in-group more, they might still have certain stereotypes about Quechua and Aymara individuals. So we're going to test that next. Okay, so do linguistic boundaries motivate stereotyping? Sorry for the awkward pauses. Okay, so in order to ask this question, I used a triad task where I presented participants, um, both children and adults, again with three characters, two of whom here in orange spoke Quechua, and the other two um, in blue spoke, or the other two um, were the same in that they had the same occupational category. Okay, so two of them share the same language, and two of them share the same subsistence pattern occupation. So here the blue ones worked fixing cars, whereas the other one did farming. Okay. Okay, and then I asked them various questions about potential novel traits, like eating bado. So I told them that the bottom character liked eating bado, and asked them to predict who else would also like eating bado. 
So they have to either make a language-based prediction or an occupational-based prediction about others. It was a forced choice. And in another study, instead of using these real language labels and these real occupations, I used fictional labels, but with an analogous context. So I told them that two of the characters spoke Soreda, these aren't real languages, um, just to see what they would do when they weren't reasoning about the languages in their real world context, but some other languages that could exist in the world. And I tried to also do novel um, kind of occupational or subsistence kinds of activities. Okay, the Indian analogous context study, we told them that the two languages corresponded to communities roughly three hours walking distance from each other. So that it was similar to the Wakasani context that they were familiar with in terms of the geographic distribution. And then in a third study, we used the fictional labels, but we didn't analogize it to the local context. We just used the labels, okay? So what will this category novelty do to linguistic stereotyping? Well, we see that it increases the extent to which they rely on the language to make predictions about new people. So on the y-axis here, we see the probability that the participants will make a language-based prediction about these characters as opposed to an occupation-based prediction. And for the real-world scenario on the far left, Fewer than half of the participants thought that the two girls would be similar on the basis of um, language. They thought that occupation was more important, although obviously not significantly so. And then the more different the scenario is to their local context, the more likely they are to entertain the possibility that, um, that language is predictive of novel cultural traits. Okay, so they, the more they're willing to form stereotypes about um, others on the basis of language. And of course, the only ones that are actually significant here in terms of a pairwise comparison are the real world and the fictional um, condition. Okay, so it's as if they've learned that in their local context, language doesn't matter, but in another context, it might. Then finally, in a fourth study, I used audio cues instead so that the participant, the characters actually spoke in Quechua or in Amara. Um, but then they also spoke in Spanish to make sure that all of the information was transmitted to participants. So they said, hi, my name is Bla, um, I speak Quechua and I work fixing cars. Um, and then they would say the same thing in Spanish as well. Um, and in this condition, particularly, we see a strong developmental shift. Now, the developmental shift I'm showing you here was similar in the other studies, particularly in the other real-world um, condition that I told you about earlier with the labels, but it's even stronger here when we use the audio cue. So here's the, I'm showing you the probability of making a language-based prediction as a function of age. The line represents the bottom axis, the continuous um, age, category, age variable, and the dots represent the discontinuous age categories that um, around the top axis. So you can see that below age 8, children are more likely to make a prediction based on language that others speak, whereas after age 20, not significantly so, but adults are more likely to use occupation as a basis of making predictions about others. Okay. So there's this developmental shift. So language-based stereotyping um, Adults will use the language cue, but only in novel scenarios, only when they haven't already learned that Quechua and Aymara is not useful for forming stereotypes, um, because they have learned that it's not locally relevant. On the other hand, children do use the cues, even when adults do not, and this is despite the historical changes where I think that um, the Quechua and Aymara difference should be less important for children than it was for adults because they're learning Spanish, because there actually is a shift towards um, speaking more Spanish than the indigenous languages even. Okay. So I don't think that it's driven by a cohort effect, although of course it would be great to get longitudinal data. Okay. So even if they don't have stereotypes about this language boundary, even if they're not in-group motivated or in-group altruistic, um, they might still believe that once you're Quechua, you're always Quechua, whatever that's worth. And in order to test this possibility of essentialism, uh, about the possibility that 
people think that language identities are inherited from parents. Um, we use a vignette that departmental psychologists often use. It's called the switched at birth vignette, where we tell people a story about a baby who was born to one set of birth parents. Those birth parents tragically die in the child's infancy, and the child is, you know, mercifully adopted by a different set of parents from a different community. Um, and then the child never learns that his birth parents were from a different community. Okay? So then we ask participants, when Michael, this baby, grows up, he be casual like his birth parents or Amara like his adoptive parents. Okay? So if they choose Ketra like his birth parents, they have a birth parent bias. They're saying something like, even though the child doesn't know that he was born to Ketra parents, even though he probably won't even speak Ketra, I think they generally kind of recognize that, he'll still be Ketra. Do people reason that way? Well, in another, and then in another condition, we ask the same question, but about regional differences that are associated with market integration differences. So when Marco is grown up, will he be Imeño, like from Lima, a big city, like his birth parents, or what is Aneño, like his adoptive parents from a rural, kind of an identity associated with a rural small village? Okay. What do we see here? Okay, so we see that, again, a very similar trajectory for the language reasoning in the sense that here, children under age 8 or 9, more or less, are, are choosing that Marco will be Quechua, like his birth parents, above chance, whereas the adults stop reasoning like this. The adults say, no, Marco will be Aymara, like his adoptive parents. Okay, so there is this developmental shift in terms of how they reason about language. On the other hand, the way that they reason about this regional identity, whether he will be Limeño or Watasaneño, the children don't really have very strong intuitions. They're kind of like in the middle, okay? And it looks like the adults are becoming more essentialist about region, but in other studies I actually confirmed that this isn't really um, kind of a genetic inheritance heuristic. What they're saying is that if you're born in Watasani, you are from Watasani. Now, if the child had been born in Lima of what the sunny parents, he would have been Limeño, okay? So this is really not very essentialist. It's saying you are where you are born, not you are whatever your parents were. Okay, so the beliefs that linguistic identity are inherited and stable, again, we only see them in children in Matasani, and we don't see them for regional identities in Matasani. Now you might want to know whether this is cross-culturally true and we started doing a project that might let us do, um, get at that because this method has been so commonly used cross-culturally and across development. Um, we started putting a meta-analysis to put all of these data together. Okay, so there's a lot of cross-site variation in beliefs that identities are stable. So what I'm showing you here, each dot represents a different effect size, a different proportion of um, participants that say that the child is the identity of its birth parents, even if he's adopted by a different set of parents. And each of the different um, colors or lines here on the right hand side represents a different boundary. Okay, so for example, the top one, they were participants in Ann Arbor in the US that were being asked about the Portuguese versus English language difference, okay? So the ones that are at 20 years of age, those are basically all of the adult populations. I've just um, collapsed them all to 20 years of age. And um, for the American samples, that's not so wrong because they're usually college students. And so you can see, first of all, if you just limit yourself to the adult population, there's a lot of variation there. Going all the way from like 90% of people saying you are whatever your parents are to something like 5% of people saying you are whatever your parents are. And then if we go along the age axis to look at what children look like, well, they're also scattered all over the place and not very clustered in one direction or the other. It looks actually like they're hovering around 
So are they confused or are they just, um, or do they have a bias, but then it depends on the boundary? Well, it's a little bit hard to tell, but I will show you some evidence suggesting that um, they might have a bit of a bias. If we now connect the dots, so some of these are the same study with that uh, have been done with adults and with children. Um, So if we connect the dots in those studies, we see that it looks like on average the children are more essentializing than the adults are, okay? Now it's not very clean cut, there are some sites where it seems to go up with development, um, but this corresponds to approximately a difference of children uh, having an average of 55% of their responses being essentializing um, and adults having them be about 33%, okay? Now, in contrast to that, so it, does, so it does look like ethnic stability beliefs might decrease with age, average, but also perhaps diversify with age, okay? Now, in contrast to that, um, people have actually run the same study with species reasoning. So I haven't done this, but some people have been bold enough to ask their participants if a duck is adopted by a chicken, or they don't use the labels, they just show them pictures, like let's say a duck was born to a set of ducks, but then it's adopted by chickens, will that creature be a duck when it grows up, or a chicken when it grows up, okay? Um, I, I suspect I know your answer is, but it's kind of interesting that even among adults here, there's quite a lot of variation, so it's not so obvious that everybody will say, yes, it will be a duck, like it's birth parents. But also interesting, um, you know, there's more variation in children, so they're not so sure. Children generally are noise production machines, as um, some of you might know, and but they also seem to be more shifted towards above 50% compared to the previous slide, right? So they seem to be more sure that the chicken will be a chicken like its birth parents than they are that uh, that will be true for humans. Um, ethnic identities. So there's less variation in species reasoning, and if anything, the developmental trajectory is towards increasing with age, right? So people become more sure as they age, and it homogenizes that um, ch chickens will be chickens if they're born from parents that are chickens, okay? So this still is a bit preliminary, and we want to start looking at what is some variation across the human groups. So, for example, are fun, fun is more essential of this or not? Uh, but for now, I'm going to recap the results from the Peruvian context at least. Um, they're suggesting that in group altruism really is happening at the community level among adults in this context. So they are more likely to give money to members of their own community, they're more likely to be, they punish thieves from their own community less. And ethnographically, it's also the case that you can see that they organize meetings, they organize dance competitions, they organize parties at the level of the community, not at the level of language groups. On the other hand, the children, they showed a slightly higher group language bias than the adults did, but it wasn't very strong. And actually, other developmental psychologists have found stronger effects there with respect to the language bias that children have. And um, we can talk about that later, maybe in the discussion. I'm not so sure that it's motivated by cooperation. It might be motivated by learning mechanisms instead. Now, in terms of stereotyping, we saw that adults form stereotypes or are more likely to make predictions about others on the basis of market integration difference or occupational differences that corresponded to um, differences in, in how subsistence oriented or market integrated they were. While the children in the same context did privilege language for predicting how other new people would behave. What? How did we get there? Are you seeing one of the early slides? We're seeing very colorful pictures. Oh, that's not right. I don't know how they got there. Uh, sorry. 
Well, I could just um, finish off by saying also um, that the third pattern that we saw was that children were essentialists, where they thought that identity was inherited, like the language identity was inherited from the parent to the child, to the child, even if the child didn't know their own parents. Um, but the adults didn't reason this way at all. The adults didn't essentialize any language, any boundary, let alone the language boundary. Okay, so this pattern, I think, is consistent with the argument that I was proposing earlier, which is that we should be thinking about um, how... Here we go. Hopefully I can go in. That we should be thinking about how different features of the landscape correspond to different parts of different parts of ethnic reasoning or different psychological adaptations or motivations. Okay? So on the other hand, so that, that's what the adult picture looks like. On the other hand, the children do look somewhat consistent in privileging the language boundary for a lot of social phenomena. And there are multiple reasons that might be the case. So one possibility is that it's an adaptation for learning about social groups in their environment. And as we were talking about earlier, humans have often been structured along language boundaries. They have been important throughout the history. They have been important in a lot of ethnographic contexts. They might facilitate coordination. And so children might look to language boundaries first early on in development when they're trying to figure out which orders here are important. How should I predict other people's behavior? Who should I learn from? Who should I be friends with? Um, or what does it mean to be inherently a member of a group? So that's one possibility. Another possibility that I think is not as well fleshed out, but that I think merits more consideration, is that children, especially around this age, four, five, ten, they are having to become confident language learners. They're really good at it. I'm very jealous of them. They learn languages very quickly. Um, but that's because, in part, they're devoting a lot of energy, cognition, cognitive resources to being able to do that. So it could be that that kind of cognitive um, mechanism for learning languages, which actually starts getting inputs even in utero, like we mentioned earlier, might be kind of interfacing with the social group psychology in ways that make them think that language is more important than other cues. Okay, so that would be a slightly less adaptationist perspective on the way that the psychology might be organized for children learning about ethnic landscapes in their world. I think that the conclusions are pretty much just what I mentioned already. Um, so maybe we don't have to go over them again. Just uh, one more point is that the, so there are possibly distinct selection pressures, and by selection pressures we have to consider cultural selection pressures, not just genetic selection pressures, and it's hard to know which ones are driving which. Part of the reason for looking at children is for the possibility that there are certain genetic, um, you know, psychological mechanisms that facilitate their learning about their social worlds, the same way that they become, they have genetic adaptations for becoming good language learners. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to add, just from the last kind of meta-analysis that I've been looking at, is that um, it doesn't seem like the early developing cognitive mechanisms for what look like some people talk about as essentialism are really being heavily borrowed from species reasoning. So we get different developmental um, trajectories for the way that people think about species, and we also get different um, kind of baseline levels of um, essentialism for the human kinds compared to the species kinds. So I know that there's this proposal, I think I sent it around as one of the possible readings by Francisco Phil White suggesting that humans think about ethnic groups as if they were species, and the meta-analysis doesn't seem to bear out that that link is very strong. So I just want to thank all of you for listening, and uh, hopefully the uh, Technology wasn't too frustrating, the lab was too high. Um, I want to also thank field teams that helped select a lot of this data, the communities of Wakasani who um, tolerated my ridiculous questions, and also funding sources for this research. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to entertain any questions or discussions.
things here, they can go to your questions about terminology that they have this year. Yeah, I actually have a question about that. Uh, first of all, really thank you so much for the lecture because it was a, such a thorough research into this one question. Um, and I'm wondering about uh, the role of adaptation here. So if you discuss uh, ethnic reasoning and adaptations, um, then you, uh, I'm sure uh, correctly that uh, you can't really say whether they are like innate or culture. So it can be a context of culture adapting to its context of use, or it can be a case where you can see uh, evidence of this native bias. Um, right. But you can't really say which is which is the case here. So I'm wondering uh, where could you go next? So uh, if you wanted to try to make a nativist case here, if you wanted to show that these stereotypes are really innate, do you have some ideas? Yeah, so I would never say that the stereotypes are innate. I think that the best case for a nativist um, kind of proposal would be that we have ways of learning about the world that developmentally, early in development privilege certain kinds of boundaries for thinking in groups, okay? So obviously people have to learn that, let's say there are actually a couple of stereotypes about Kesha and Aymar speakers, for example, but they took a long time to get out of people. So for example, um, Kesha-speaking uh, speak women are supposed to wear uh, less colorful, less bright clothing than the MRS speaking women. So obviously that cannot be genetically specified, that has to be there. But it's possible that if you think you're, you're a developing child and you're thinking, what are the kinds of um, people that dress differently or that might behave differently in the world, that you might think language is one that really matters. Um, how to get at this more compellingly, um, apart from what I've done, I think for one, even the evidence that I showed you does suggest that there's some of this early development bias, even in a cultural context where the adults don't do that. I think one of the first things that uh, I should assuage people of is the possibility that this is a cohort effect. So one way to do that would be to actually get better longitudinal data. Okay. One confound that would still be there would be the possibility that children have different exposure to different kinds of people in the world than adults do, right? So if that's the case, then another thing that should be kind of controlled for or trying to quantify is kind of how many exposures they have with people who speak different languages. Um, and one possibility I didn't mention here, but one thing that I keep meaning to do is kind of try to fit a model to see if once ch uh, children, or in that case adolescents, reach high school, maybe they see a big peak in how many people of a different language they start interacting with. Now that they're in a high school, that's about 50-50, and maybe that strongly changes the way that they think about those categories. Um, so if we could get a better sense of, kind of what children's environments look on look like early on, we might be able to see if the in, just the inputs could differ for them. I, I think honestly that um, for some people that data will also not be compelling or it will be indistinguishable from a mechanism that didn't evolve for social group reasoning but that evolved for language learning. So imagine you're having to learn Quechua really well, you want to learn Quechua from the right people, you hear somebody that doesn't sound like they're speaking the things that you've already statistically clustered together, well, you're going to kind of like ignore them, put them in a bin of people that you shouldn't really trust as um, sources of language information. I think that that wouldn't really predict the essentialism difference, right? Because there's no reason why you would think Oh, people who speak a certain language uh, speak that language because their birth parents were like that. Um, and actually, I'm not the only person who has found that. Also, um, government, Hirschfeld and Gelman found that with US uh, participants thinking about the Portuguese versus English difference. They also saw that children thought that language was kind of genetically inherited, even though adults did not. And that's curious because that's actually the 
that's the outcome, the essentialist outcome is the one that I'm least convinced by, the one that I, I struggle the most to understand what it's accomplishing for people. Um, so I, I'm not going to be an infant researcher, but there is also infant research that you can look at earlier on in development even, that infants do have a preference for interacting with others that sound like their parents or their mother, uh, and you know, whether this is a more general familiarity bias uh, or whether it's specific to language, I think is not yet well differentiated. But there are some outcomes that you might be able to test that are with infants as well. You might even be able to do the stereotype work with infants, right? So you might be able to do something like looking time and show that they're more surprised if um, two individuals who speak the same language do something different than two individuals who speak different languages. Um, but then you want to compare it to another kind of similarity that's not just language, right? So there's some possibilities. Yeah, and yeah. You, need, you need a really detailed uh, data, there's a really detailed access to the culture. Um, mm -hmm. So a follow-up to that, I'm wondering uh, how, do, uh, how does a common anthropologist uh, take your research? Because I, th I think the idea that something could be uh, innate would be uh, maybe something that they don't really want to accept initially. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I see that methods should be really convincing to them, and when you show them the evidence, they, I, mean, I think they could be convinced. But. Most of them are not, and most of them think that they're possible. So, especially cultural anthropologists. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's an important question there, and hopefully, I should be able to address it there. Uh, but most of them kind of share insights. To argue that this has to be driven by different inputs or different niches, uh, and that it's not evidence of kind of adaptation or privileging language cues. Um, and, and it's a real problem because, as you mentioned, that you want really detailed data, and that's really hard to get. Not to mention that um, I, the people aren't talking their, to their children all the time about other like, outgroups in the world. So Susan Gelman has some really beautiful data and um, Gail Hyman have beautiful data showing that if you label um, people, for example, you call them carrot leaders, uh, people start, children start making more inferences about them, start making more about them. Or if you show um, children pictures of dolls and then you label uh, you tell them that they're dolls and you give them a label, like this is a whoppet, this is a pink or something, I forget the names, um, and you tell them that they're dolls, they don't make inductive inferences so much about them, but now you show them the same pictures and you say this is a whoppet, this is a blink, and you say that those are humans, they start making inferences about them. And so it suggests that the, the labeling people might be one way that um, kind of children learn which are the kind of important language labels in the world, or which are the important social labels in the world. And so getting a detailed kind of ethnographic picture of those label inputs might be really important, but I think that it would just be um, kind of a bit of a fantasy at the moment, because they're going to be relatively rare events. Um, so yeah, cultural anthropologists are reticent to believe that, um, most of them, that there could be these kinds of priors um, particularly for categorizing the social world. And honestly, the developmental data shows that even if those priors are there, they're, they're weak enough that we can end up in pretty much any equilibria, or I don't know if any, but that we're able to change our expectations, right? The adults don't hold on to Ketra and Imar are different later on in life. Um, although, interestingly, they maintain this expectation that other languages might be uh, important organizers of, this, of the social world. So, um, yeah, 